This Christmas, Santa's <laughs> going to make everyone happy. <laughs> the grown-ups. And the kids. Everyone has their holiday traditions, and watching certain movies is no different. Thanksgiving has the John Hughes classic planes, trains, and automobiles. <laughs> well, July 4th is always a good time to dust off Independence Day and let Bill Pullman give us goosebumps with his speech. Christmas has undoubtedly the largest selection of Stone Cold classics. You have your Christmas vacations, your It's a Wonderful Life, and your Die Hards. Yeah, we said it. Die Hard is a Christmas movie, damn it. Of course, we discuss genre on this channel and horror movies, holiday themed or not, can age like fine wine, or in the spirit of the holidays, like bad eggnog. <laughs> Today, we look at the taxi driver of Christmas movies, great call out by our editor Mike, by the way, and see if Christmas Evil stands the test of time. Ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas! Released in a very limited theatrical run in November of 1980, Christmas Evil, which is also a better watch out in Terror in Toyland, didn't make a ton of money and was lost for quite some time. It had a way too high budget of $850,000 for an independent, non-studio film and was marketed as a slasher off the success of films like Halloween two years prior. The film follows Harry Stadling, who is just a bit obsessed with Santa Claus. He doesn't just subscribe to the naughty or nice philosophy either. Harry goes full punishment for the bad and reward for the good children of the world. He saw his father, who he thought was the real Santa, getting a little too cozy and warm with his mom and it forever changed him. Harry works at a toy factory and was recently promoted, but his co-workers all see him as the weird guy who is way too into Christmas and don't take him seriously. His younger brother Phil, played by Frank Darabont favorite Jeffrey DeMunn, worries about him constantly but also treats him like a burden. When we first see adult Harry, he has already decided to become Santa. He spies on all the neighborhood children, has countless Christmas decorations littering his house, and puts on a suit and beard that he never takes off again. His work devises a scheme on disadvantaged children, and a co-worker makes him snap after lying about the reason he needed a night off from work. Harry ends up dropping off gifts from the factory to a children's hospital, and then kills several people coming out of a church. He drops off presents for his brother's kids, but then kills his co-worker who deceived him. On Christmas Day, Harry is surrounded by an angry mob of a town who force him to flee to his brother's house before he eventually drives off a bridge. Or does he? In his own mind, Harry is flying off his own personal sleigh to do the work of Saint Nick. There are a few moments that the movie lays out as either magic to be taken as fact or purely seen from the character's warped perspective. The movie didn't do well on initial release. It was written and directed by former porn director Lewis Jackson. Jackson came up with the idea after getting high and imagining Santa brandishing a knife. While it was released in 1980, the script floated around the studios for nearly a decade and was really only made after the wild success of John Carpenter's Halloween. It was incorrectly marked as a slasher, and while it does contain some of the key elements to that subgenre, it has much more to it than that. It went way over budget and was lost for some time before cult director icon John Waters started singing its praises. Eventually, it was released on Blu-ray by Vinegar Syndrome with the uncut 100-minute version. The rest of the cast is mostly unknown, though it does feature the film debut of Home Improvement's Patricia Richardson, and the main character of Harry is played by Fiona Apple's dad. Last time, we took a pretty deep dive into things that are constantly changing due to fashion or verbiage. While I think those have merit, I will agree that people 30 or 40 years from now watching movies from today will feel the same way we do about older movies. I can't believe you're making this about you! Clothes, cars, and slang will all change, but how about things that change as a whole society does? Christmas Evil has a few things that really stand out 42 years later. Super Santa has his not radar blown up by a local scamp, Moss Garcia, who uses bad language and spends his time looking at dirty magazines. When Harry goes over to mark the house and scares Moss, the young Garcia tries to tell his mom all about it, but she isn't having it. When he won't drop it, instead of getting in the car like she asks, she smacks him pretty good. Now, parenting styles have always and will always differ, but it's pretty well established that physical correction on kids has gone out the window. Punish. <laughs> Moss isn't even surprised when it happens, showing this isn't his first rodeo dealing with capital punishment. You don't really see this in movies at all unless they are trying to A, show how utterly awful the parent or parental figure is, 
or B, portraying a time when that was not only accepted, but really the norm depending on the region you were in. That leads us directly into another rather troubling, but also okay for the time scenario. The whole reason that Harry knows about the kids is that he stalks some of them and hangs out with them in the streets of the neighborhood. Susie, you look so beautiful. Whether or not the parents ever discovered a whole freaking book chronicling the good and bad actions of these kids, there's no way they would be okay now with an obvious loner who isn't all there mentally hanging out unsupervised with their kids. Sure, there could be the kindly old widower or the cat lady down the street that the kids could be attached to, but a guy in his late 30s or 40s being around that much would draw instant ire. Hey, how are you? I'm good. Good. Why don't you have a seat right on that stool, please? This also ties into the scene where he just shows up to the children's hospital to drop off toys. There is no way that he would be able to show up now with no appointment or ID and give unchecked toys to needy kids. Another sign of the time stemming from that is just how accepting and trusting most people are. I talked a little bit about being able to just vanish as kids and come back to some undetermined time, but my folks never locked our front door growing up. Ever. Harry is able to just stroll into any house he picks well after he fails at magicking his way into the chimneys. If someone was trying to accomplish this insanity in today's world, they would be greeted by many a locked door and probably one of three main streaming doorbell services that would help in leading to his capture. Harry is able to stroll into a few houses to drop off good and bad presents, but also uses that unchecked power to kill his heel of a coworker that tricks him into working the factory floor. The last one is somewhat complicated, but it's about a diagnosis. I'm not only referring to the disassociative disorder that he suffers from while believing he is the Santa and that his sick van is the mechanized reincarnation of the reindeer either. Harry would show up on the spectrum in some way or another and people would wonder what could be up with him rather than just calling him weird and assuming him harmless? Please take this writer's word as sincere as someone who deals with someone on the spectrum daily when I say that he would be noticed and someone would get him diagnosed for help. Or, at the very least, looked into to stop something tragic like this from happening. Most of the things today that are rightfully put to paper with names and medications or therapies were chalked up to just off, particularly 42 years ago. The seriousness of this movie makes it stand head and shoulders above many of its contemporaries and leads it to a gravitas that still holds true today. There is really no humor here, either intentional or not, and it has a sadness that makes us almost root for Harry even as he murders people that don't deserve it. You genuinely care about his mental health and worry for those around him. When Harry walks into the Christmas party and has a great time celebrating the season, you think it could be one of those moments that turns him around and maybe everything will be okay. When he turns to the children, however, he has a sinister air about him that the kids don't fully understand, and the parents worry this Santa may be going too far. What we know about Harry, there's a little part of us that wonders if anyone in the room is safe with him there. With no silliness found in the film, it makes the sudden violence that much more shocking for us when it happens. All of the deaths mean something as Harry slips further and further away from reality and his own humanity. The story of the movie can be good or crap, but it's acting that can elevate or dive bomb how a movie is perceived, and the acting done by Brandon Maggart is lights out. He's a haunted and frightening individual that can coast between genial and homicidal in a matter of moments. Maggart's movie career pretty much begins and ends here, but there's a solid chance you could have recognized him on TV. Different generations could have caught him as one of the main Waters brothers on the show Brothers that ran for over 100 episodes, and a completely different generation may have noticed him for his appearances on Boy Meets World and our beloved Adventures of Briscoe County Jr. with Bruce Campbell. Harry is both the good guy and the bad guy of our story, and even after killing people in front of the church, we still feel for him. Finally, the ending really holds up. No sequel baiting or jump scares, just a deep look into the insanity of this one man. People like to debate what is actually happening here as we mentioned in other parts the movie presents some of the more magical moments as well, real. I like to think a little more grounded. Harry drives over the bridge and crashes to his death, but in his last moments he is taking his van sleigh into the night sky to travel to the North Pole. The writer-director preferred to liken his story more to that of Frankenstein than anything else and we certainly see that with the mob of angry torch-wielding citizens. Our monster here doesn't fare any better than Frankenstein's monster, but at times he's almost as sympathetic. The universal monster was made by a madman who wanted to play God and never wanted to exist. 
Harry was molded by nature and nurture until he finally breaks, but his heart is doing no wrong to himself or those around him. While much of Christmas Evil is spot on and is still sad and frightening today, the music throughout the film struggles to hit the spot. A few scenes make it work, but that is usually when they are playing the more traditional public domain Christmas music or the licensed classic Christmas tunes. The score tries to play with different iterations throughout the runtime, but often falls flat. I don't blame the composers either as Jackson spent a huge amount of the film's budget on securing the cinematographer from Europe he had his eyes on. Don Christensen, Joel Harris, and Julie Hayward all either have no credits to their name besides this movie or Christmas Evil was their first. That's a hard gig to walk into for anyone combined with the constraining budget and flip-flopping tone the producers wanted the movie to go towards. The other thing that doesn't quite hold up is the tone itself we just mentioned. The movie was marketed all wrong and I can see where people wanting a slasher movie were disappointed that 80% of the kills happen in one scene and people wanting a psychological thriller were put off by the gore the movie has in a couple of big scenes. It would have been better suited to the movie if it go all in one way or the other. By adding gore and another death scene to the movie, it may have done better in theaters due to repeat gore hounds going to see it, and by toning back completely, it may have stuck around more as a cult classic sooner and seen by a wider audience. Christmas Evil is still criminally underseen and talked about even with Vinegar Syndrome's great looking Blu-ray in an appearance on one of Joe Bob's Shutter Christmas specials. Check out either or both for more insight into what this movie is and a great drive-in breakdown. The film is unlike any Christmas horror and doesn't use any gimmick or force itself into one subgenre of horror. It isn't campy or aimed at kids. It's not the first in a line of unnecessary sequels. It examines mental illness and many aspects of the holiday season from family to the selfishness of corporations to really believing in something that time of year. It deserves to be seen by more people and absolutely stands the test of time. Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night.